you're welcome. Is can I read? Oh yeah, I turned my reading music off because I haven't replaced it yet. And I don't know if Twitch will like it yet. But hello everyone. This is Brandy Moore Smith live in the Bin Library. And we're back with letters in the uh, how far are we in this book? We're 23% through this book. And not too much has happened so far. But hello, everyone. Hello, Jake13. Hello, the native gamer. Hi, Boris. Hi, Lucas. Hi, Normal Size Phantom. Hi, Jabba Hop. Hi, Twitch. Hi, YouTube. Oh, God. Um, I'll give you a little summary of what we got so far. So, Cammy, uh, our protagonist is in her final year of high school. Hello, Void. Welcome back to a weirdo keeps giving me love letters in the closet. In the attic. It's in the attic. Book. Last time, Bryony burned a letter she got in the attic because it was cringe. I did not. I would say I don't... I do have an attic. I don't want to check it for love letters. I don't really want need any love letters. I already have a boy and he's wonderful. Unless it was him leaving the love letters, but he doesn't go in the attic. He hates it, so I know it wouldn't be him. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> straight out of summer said it's Friday or a <laughs> I love it. I love that it's a different English town every time. I love it. <laughs> Ten out of ten greetings once more from normal size factory. Anyway, the summary. The summary I was gonna give you. Cammy and her mother have moved to a town in the middle of nowhere uh, because Daddy has died. But Daddy died in a drunk drunk driving incident in which he was the drunk and took out two of the town's kind of um, favorite, basically, like the, the star quarterback and the cheerleader sort of situation. Um, so they were facing a lot of abuse for that, so they moved out um, to live in the same town as the mother's sister and her husband. Her husband is the principal of the high school. Poor old Cammy was very nervous on her first day because uh, she thought, oh no, they're going to bully me because I don't have a car. And my uncle is the principal. How lame! But actually, she found a nice little group of friends. She's joined the art club and she's doing fine. They live in this like really kind of large, creepy house now. And she went for an explore and she went into the old dusty attic. And she found a nice little table that didn't have any dust on. And an origami bird, which seemed to be a letter. And it was a love letter. <gasps> a love letter. Who she kind of wished it was addressed to her at the time. Because I didn't say who it was for. And she kind of pocketed it because she's she's been kind of sad. And the letter made me had made her made her feel nice, so she kept it. Um, and then life went on. She talked about art projects. She went into the forest. She keeps thinking someone's watching her from the forest. Be like the origami killer. Who knows? There's been no bodies yet. Um, and eventually, she found another letter in the attic. Uh, she doesn't know how. Any, oh, it was put there. So she just the letter says that um, there will be another one every night for her. So she decides to stake it out. And as she does, she sees the window in the attic open and the letter literally fly itself down like the little bird that it's origamied and place itself on the table, which is weird, really weird. So she kind of freaks out about it, which is fair. But then she decides to kind of accept them because, I don't know, because she's a stupid genius. And not tell anyone about the creepy magic letters and stuff. Um, in fact, after her friend left, she decided to write her own letter. Did we see what she wrote? In chapter 8. Hi, it's me, Cammy. I just wanted to let you know I've been reading your letters. They're beautiful. You're obviously way better than this than I am. I want to learn more about you. If, re if you're reading this, please give me a sign that you received this letter. I have to know that you're real. Love, Z. Oh, and all the letters have been signed Love, Z. 
that someone called Z. I'm I. This is a YA, so I'm guessing like a Xander. Xander seems like a lovely YA-ish boy name. <laughs> or Zachary. I don't know. Zelda, maybe. Maybe it's a lady. Maybe this is secretly gay and it's a lady. I, I, I'd be less. I'd be okay with that. I read over my letter for the hundredth time. My words weren't poetic like my secret admirers had been. They were straightforward and to the point. I concentrated on making it look legible as possible, but my handwriting still didn't hold a candle to his loopy calligraphy. My notebook paper also looked out of place next to the old, fa old fancy-looking pages that had been left for me, but I didn't have anything else to work with. I had to communicate with him somehow. Okay, no matter how real some unnatural things are, you don't tell them anybody because literally no one will believe you and you'll be stamped off as crazy. That's that's kind of true, but she could still probably tell her mum that she's finding weird letters in the attic and one of them had her name on and therefore she could have a weird stalker. I think she should still tell her mother that. She could admit the weird birdie part. Fine. That would be weird. But like... For her own safety, she should tell someone. <laughs> the chair in front of my table was much more comfortable than the spot I had inhabited the night before. I didn't want to hide from him exactly, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to make my presence known just yet either. The candle sat and lit before me, and I considered lighting it to let him know that I was there. But I didn't know if my presence would scare him off. I needed to give him my letter and let him know I wasn't interested in turning him in for trespassing before I did anything else. My watch face glowed in the darkness, informing me it was just after 11.30. I was too wired over the fact that I was about to communicate with my secret admirer. I had no fear of falling asleep on the job tonight. I gave my letter one last glance, the words barely visible in the moonlight and then began to make the folds necessary to deliver my correspondence. Michael and I had made enough of them over the years that I could probably fold the paper in my sleep. In only a few moments, my letter was transformed into a perfectly aerodynamic paper aeroplane. There were more clouds out tonight, making it harder to see my backyard below, and I had taken the liberty of cleaning the dirt-smudged window a few hours before so only the darkness stood as a barrier now. The moonlight broke through the clouds intermittently, giving me a few minutes at a time where the yard was just visible for my straining eyes. My eyes were beginning to water from the force of my staring when the sky suddenly opened, casting illuminating rays and scattering the shadows across the grass. With the arrival of the light, I could just make out a dark figure moving quickly away from the cursed woods, in the direction of the back of my house, directly towards me. I held my breath as he drew closer and attempted to give to get my heart rate under control. If it didn't settle down, my heartbeat alone would give me away. Surely every creature within a mile radius could hear it pounding in my chest. The figure showed no signs of stopping, and I wondered if he would run all the way up to the house and begin climbing the side of it. He appeared to be nimble enough for the job. Just before reaching the flower bed that ran the perimeter around the porch, though, he stopped in his tracks. I imagined that I could hear his heavy breathing mixed with the crickets, owls, and other country noises that made up the soundtrack of my new home. He had moved so quickly, and the length of our yard made for a lo very long sprint. I was surprised he wasn't bent over double trying to catch his breath. But he wasn't bent over. The fig stood tall, his shoulders squared, portraying the perfect picture of confidence. Or what I could only assume was confidence, with the limited lighting and distance separating us. I knew without a doubt he was intent on the mission set before him. The figure was lifting his face to look up at my window. Then another cloud rolled across the moon, cloaking him in darkness once again. I silently cursed the clouds for their terrible timing. 
Couldn't they have wasted a few more seconds before blocking my view? I just wanted to see, finally see his face, and get an idea of how he delivered the birds to the attic, of course. I picked my letter up and prepared myself for what came next. I knew my window of opportunity would be small, so I held the paper aeroplane in my right hand, aimed at the currently closed window, ready to launch as soon as it opened. The seconds ticked by as I waited, frozen in my ready-to-throw pose. I knew at the back of my mind that very little time had passed, but it seemed like hours since he had arrived at the flower bed below. I reminded myself to breathe. That would just be perfect if I passed out due to lack of oxygen and missed my chance. Unnatural things. Mom, mom, Brandy drank coffee, Brandy drank coffee. And then my mom bursts into J. Joan Jameson laughter. You serious? Nah, hold up. A minute after he arrived, the attic window finally eased itself open. As I waited patiently as I could for the bird to invite itself inside, its wings flapping, happily excited to deliver its message. When I launched my paper aeroplane out into the night, two seconds passed and the window closed behind it. The bird lay on the table in front of me, still at last. But I ignored it for the time being. I didn't dare move. Not in the precious moments following the delivery of my letter. He was supposed to give me a sign that he received it. I didn't know what kind of sign he might choose, but I wasn't about to miss it because I was fumbling around with the paper bird. What if he didn't receive my letter, though? It was so dark out. Even the white paper aeroplane could be swallowed up by the darkness. I had a sinking feeling. It, I might sit here for hours waiting for some sign that was never going to come. My poor letter laying unseen in the flower bed where it crash landed below. It would lay there collecting dew until the morning, and by the time I retrieved it, the letter would be soaked through, my words unreadable and utterly useless, just like my plan had been. I, wa I was watching the scene unfold in my mind when a surge of movement in front of me brought me back to, my brought me back to the present. The window opened wide, closed, and then opened again, almost playfully. The candle on the table flickered to life, blinding me momentarily in the sudden burst of light. If those acts alone didn't warrant enough evidence that my letter had been received, then what happened next would lay all my doubts to rest. A voice spoke out of the night, carried to my ears through the open window, like it was riding the wind. Good night, Cammy. The voice whispered in my ear. I'll be back at the same time tomorrow. The voice was rich, textured, and distinctly male. No gay. It was deep, but not too deep. I felt for certain that the speaker was close to my age. Almost as an afterthought, the voice added, Bring more paper. We can talk. Oh, hey, Nakko-chan. You the best lurker? I have some pretty good lurkers, I don't know. It's, 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 a, it's a high crown to be my best lurker. <laughs> Imagine falling in love with a ghost. Oh shit, that's me! <laughs> Second best. <laughs> Would the best lurker really be able to claim the crown of lurker because then they'd have to chat? <laughs> And with that, the window slid closed again. The candle flame was driven to the right before being extinguished in a puff of smoke. A phantom breath blowing it out. I tried to see what was happening in my yard, but my eyes couldn't adjust to the abrupt darkness fast enough. Even so, I thought I could feel the presence of the boy stop just before he reached the woods and turned to look back at my window. By the time my eyes could make out the shapes lit by the now unshaded full moon. The crown was empty once again. <laughs> I could be the best lurker, but not right now. <laughs> I see. Many people are trying to crown themselves best lurker. <laughs> does, does Jake win by default because Jake's a mod? <laughs> mod rules. Mod power. <laughs> Just wait till Brandon gets monetized on Twitch and then learns how to do quality ASMR. 
And then those best lurkers are going to come out to make lots of noise and chaos. Best fan, though. Mm. You, I, Void, I do think you get crowned as one of the <laughs> number one fan. Second best fan. You guys are great. Hours after sharing words with my secret admirer, I found myself waiting on the front porch as Natalie pulled up in her truck. The morning had passed in a blur. I didn't fully remember how I came to be sitting on one of the rocking chairs by the front. Sleep had evaded me once again, and it looked like it would be a very long day if I continued to struggle to focus. At least the zombie version of myself had carried me to the porch, uh, had somehow remembered my backpack. You look like crap, Natalie said as I opened the door and climbed in. I yawned. <sighs> Didn't get much sleep. Natalie rolled her eyes and pegged me with a look that said, obviously. She turned the truck around and headed for the road that would take us to school. We quickly fell into our normal school day routine. Natalie launched into a rant about Monday mornings and how they should be outlawed by federal government and stared out of, and I stared out of the window and hmm then yeah at what I hoped were the correct places in her one-sided conversation. The truck seats had never felt so soft before and bumps were hit in the outdated roads and the bumps that were hit in the outdated roads almost soothing as they tried to rock me to sleep. I dozed undisturbed for a few minutes before Natalie pulled into the parking lot of school. I jerked awake when she drove the tyres into the parking curb. And Natalie laughed as I, at the state I was in. That's the last time I let you eat so much candy before bedtime! She joked before grabbing both of our backpacks and headed towards class. I smiled back and fell clumsily out of the truck behind her. Natalie Garfield? I don't know. I actually don't know what her last name is. I don't think it's been mentioned. I don't mind Mondays, though I'm not Garfield. I have a vendetta against Sundays, though. I don't like Thursdays. Thursdays is my worst day of the week. Because, mainly because on Wednesday evenings we play D&D. And we usually play it past my bedtime. So I'm really tired on Thursday. <laughs> so it's my own fault. But, uh, yeah. Thursday shouldn't exist. I smiled back and fell clumsily out of her truck behind her. It was times like these I wished I could somehow bottle her endless supply of energy and drink it. Maybe they could use her face as the logo for monster drinks, I thought tiredly. I have a bedtime. It's a self-imposed bedtime of 10 o'clock. I like to be in bed by 10 o'clock because I am a grandma and that is how I roll. <laughs> Not a real grandma. Just, just old. I'm an old soul. <laughs> of course, I'm ref referring to James A. Garfield, 20th President of the United States. Not the orange cat, of course. Once I got my legs moving and blood flowing, I felt myself wake up a little bit. But the drone of Mr. Angle's voice did nothing to help keep me there. The lecture on westward expansion wasn't stimulating enough to hold my interest, and I grasped at any thought that would prove loud enough to keep myself awake. Briny Aldridge Smith. <laughs> I have no clue. I'm I'm assuming that may, maybe there was a Garfield prison. I don't know. I don't know if no one says Phantom is temptress. I don't know that much about American history. <laughs> he got shot? Bro. Yeah, not my grandma, but I'll definitely eat some burnt cookies. Yeah, burnt. I hope they won't be burnt. They might be under. I'm. I'm more likely to undercook cookies than I am to burn. <laughs> Cause then they're extra gooey. <laughs> it's okay. He died. <laughs> That's fine. He died. <laughs> kind 
out of ten. <laughs> best best American history lesson we've had. <laughs> There was only one thought that could keep me awake after staying up all night, and it was the very thought that kept me awake in the first place. What was I going to do about the mysterious Z? I could feel his last letter digging into my jeans pocket, already folded and into a crumpled square after having been read dozens of times. It seemed that every letter he gave me gave me another piece of the puzzle that was my secret admirer, but I had no idea how to put them all together. I let my eyes glaze over as I thought of his most recently written words. I already had them memorized, of course. <laughs> Yay, Sam and Elle are my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I have yet to see any policemen combing the attic or trees. I hope I'm right to assume that means you haven't written me off completely yet. Or at least you aren't afraid enough to call for help yet. I really hope you can come to trust me, Cammy. I know in my heart that there is a link binding us. There is a link between us binding us. I might be coming off too strong, but trust me when I tell you that your presence only makes me stronger cannot lie to you, just as I cannot lie to myself. I must return home before anyone realizes where I've been. Just know, Cammy, I shall always return for you. Love, Z. I knew there were details about my secret admirer hidden within these lines. I spent the rest of the day trying to uncover them. He had a curfew, apparently, because... He had to get back home before anyone realised he was gone. Was he a student at my school? That idea made the most sense, but I never noticed anyone watching me during class or in the cafeteria. I never felt that presence either, the one I had experienced in the woods. In the trees, I'd felt someone watching me. And it was the same feeling that had pulled me towards the trees the closer I got to my house. I never experienced the same sensation while at school, and I was determined, and I determined that to mean my admirer wasn't a fellow classmate. From the woods, a quiet voice whispered in my head. I knew at once that I was right. If there was some kind of spirit haunting me, it didn't originate from my house. It was from the cursed woods. It probably lived there, or resided there anyways. Spirits weren't exactly, you know, living beings. Oh, maybe with other spirits that it needed to return to before they realized he was gone. Watch him turn out to be a living tree, potentially. Hey, Briny, theory. Hey, I think the secret admirer is the guy that lives out in the woods. Like from The Guardian. Maybe. Um, there's definitely... He probably lives out in the woods. That's probably correct. We haven't had established a guy who lives in the woods yet, so we don't know who that is. I wanted to bang my head on the desk as, as my thoughts returned to ghosts once again. I knew in my heart that the mysterious guy was still alive. He had to be. I attended each class in my stupor, my mind reeling with possibilities of what could be going on. Eventually I grew exhausted from mulling it over, mulling over the same ideas, and getting no closer to discovering the truth. At that point my head seemed to fill with a sort of fog, numbing my thoughts, and leaving me dazed. I recognized the zombie version of myself when she appeared, and I let her take over my body as my mind tried to recover in the background. It was out of the stupor I found myself pulled from class to class of the day. English and literature had always been one of my favourite subjects, but even the discussion of Mr. Darcy's character couldn't pull me out from the fog. Miss Stone? Mrs. Lan Lathrop? Lanthrop? Ass, from the front of the room. I had a feeling it wasn't the first time she said my name, because at that moment I looked up to see 90% of the class staring back at me. 
most of them smirking. The teacher was looking at me expectantly, and I knew I had missed something. I am sorry, what was the question? My voice was rough in my ears. From lack of use, no doubt. Mrs. La Lathrop rolled her eyes in a way that suggested she didn't get paid enough to deal with teenagers like me. Hee <laughs> hee. It's borrowed theory from an Umineko streamer. Makes sense. Yeah, I was like this in middle school. Didn't have a secret reminder. I just wanted to know what happened in the next episode of yu gi -Oh! <laughs> Similar, but with Shaman King, yes. <laughs> he turned away and asked one of the goody two-shoes in the front row the same question. I failed to hear the answer. Normally, I would have been embarrassed guilty for not paying attention in class but all i felt but all i felt as erin yoke answered the question intended for me was relief that i was off the hook shaman king is amazing she just doesn't get paid in it yeah if she get paid in fish she'd be happy obviously <laughs> i looked down at my desk to find that i'd been doodling in my notebook without realizing in the middle of my notes on Pride and Prejudice, I had drawn the attic window as I'd seen it the night before. The table was sketched lazily below with the lit candle on top. The part of the picture I'd spent the most time on, though, were the eyes. Two dark eyes stared up at me out of my notebook from outside the window. They stared through the glass, as, and I felt they were really seeing me. As if they were alive, I brushed my fingers over them lightly, and I could feel the weight I had pressed into my pencil. I must have traced over the eyes dozens, a dozen times, as they seemed to be etched into the paper now. I glanced around to see if anyone had noticed my drawing. Most of the students were quietly talk, taking their own notes, others staring off into space. A few were fixed on the clock as it sluggishly towards 3 p.m. Natalie was the only one looking in my direction, scrutinizing me in a concerned way that reminded me of my mother. She was several seats away because Miss La Lathrop was one of the few teachers who still believed in alphabetical seating charts. It was a subject we had complained about together on many occasions, but at that moment, I was grateful to not be seated next to my best friend. I tore the sheet out of my notebook and crumpled it into a ball, relaxed in my knowledge that no one had seen it. I knew there would still be questions about my odd behaviour that I would have to answer on our drive home. I also knew that Natalie's attention span was about as long as Dory's in Finding Nemo, and I could direct the conversation away from myself pretty easily. I would let her in on my secret as soon as I figured out exactly what my secret admirer entailed. For now, I just had to follow through the motions and hope whatever roller coaster I found myself strapped to would end safely on the ground and not at a broken piece of track that would launch me into space. I suppose I would make it to the ground either way. I just hoped that I would stay in one piece when this ride ultimately reached its end. That is a very cool... Me I like this whole paragraph with that. This. This whole metaphor with the roller coaster. That's so good. So good. Good writing. Good writing. I survived the ride home by asking Natalie questions about her family. Boys she had dated in the past, an embarrassing moment she could never forget. <laughs> Compared to Dory. I know, that's such a bloody, um, such a burn. My newly sparked interest kept her talking about herself for the duration of the ride and achieved my goal of keeping the conversation away from my odd behaviour. Unfortunately, the conversation and attention required on my part depleted my already meagre supply of energy. I like roller coasters. Roller coasters can be fun. I've been on a couple. I tend to get really scared though. 
I tend to be in tears by the time I get to the start of the queue. And there's some I just can't stand. But I do my best. I've tried. I'm just I'm just a coward. <laughs> By the time we arrived at my house, I was struggling more than ever to hold my eyes open. When Natalie had been easy enough to distract from my appearance, my mother was a different story. She barely made it. I she barely made it through the door before she took one glance at me, dropped her books on the table, and rushed to my side. What's wrong, honey? She felt my forehead and cheek, searching for a fever that wasn't there. I fought the urge to swat away her hands. I leant my head back against the couch and closed my eyes. I might as well take the opportunity and run with it. I don't feel so great. I didn't have to try very hard to make my voice come out weak and wavering. I was already a walking zombie, after all, and I hadn't been this tired since I contracted mono three years before. I knew my mom was flashing back to that week where I had spent 20 hours a day in bed, only getting up to stretch and go to the bathroom. My mom frowned at the lack of heat. She found in my face, but she couldn't deny that I looked sick and exhausted. I could almost hear the gears turning in her head, trying to decide if I was faking an illness to avoid some kind of test at school tomorrow, or if I was actually sick and needed to be sent to bed. In the end, her nurturing mother instincts won out. You head up onto bed and get some rest, she ordered with a squeeze of my shoulders. I nodded submissively as if I was trying to avoid bed rest all day. In reality, I've been fantasizing about the softness of my bed and the warmth of its covers and off for the past several hours. I actually thought you said Momo and got confused for a second. I probably maybe nearly did. Yes. I'll run to the store and see if I can find some Campbells. I'll check you check you I'll check up on you around supper. With that my mother turned to grab her purse. She came back to kiss my forehead before heading out to the car, its engine still warm from her recent trip home. I sighed and closed my eyes, free and alone at last. I couldn't deny that I was in dire need of sleep. Sighing again, I mustered up the strength to stuff, shuffle my way up the stairs and into my room, where I collapsed in a heap on my bed. I moaned at the softness of the pillows and comforter. They were even better than in my fantasies. Before I could pass out completely, I set my phone alarm for 11.30, taking a moment to switch the sound to vibrate so my mum wouldn't hear a screeching alarm in the middle of the night. I knew I could shed my clothes and find pyjamas, but the mattress was so soft, hugging my body in its embrace and eliminating any motivation to move. The world went black and I left my fully clothed body curled up into a ball on top of my bed behind. It seemed like a year had passed since I had managed to get any dreamless sleep. So I was surprised when I woke up when I opened my eyes and discovered it was already dark outside. I must have slept for hours without a single dream or thought that disturbed my deepest slumber. The edges of my mind were still a little fuzzy from the lingering sleep but felt more rejuvenated than I had in a long time. I was revived and ready to take on the world. I hadn't bothered to turn on a light when I came to in my room. The moonlight streaming through my window cast shadows that crept across the floor. I turned to my nightstand and found my phone sitting next to a glass of water and a bottle of ibuprofen. Something scratched my cheek, alerting me to the fact that I was cocooned under a thick, crocheted afghan. A gift from my grandmother before she passed away. My mum must have snuck in here while I was asleep and covered me up, leaving the water and medicine behind for when I woke. Normally I was a very light sleeper, so I must have been in a serious coma for her to have accomplished this feat, despite the creaky door and floorboards. The clock on my phone read 10pm. It's still had plenty of time. A loud grumbling rumble from beneath the blanket, and I discovered what must have awoken me. I was starving. I opened the drawer of my nightstand to search for the snacks I usually kept hidden from my late night hunger pains, but it was empty of anything edible. 
I remembered I had eaten the last granola bar two nights ago, but never bothered to replenish my stock. If I wanted food, I was going to have to brave the kitchen. Grabbing a pair of thick, fuzzy socks, I covered my feet to help muffle my footsteps. The house seemed to have taken pity on my tired and hungry state, because it stayed mostly quiet while I made my way carefully downstairs. With only my cell phone's light to guide me, I tiptoed into the kitchen. On the counter sat two cans of chicken noodle soup and a glass bowl ready to microwave them in. Not wanting to risk the sounds of the zapper, I hunted down a box of Riz crackers. Ritz crackers and stole a sleeve to take with me. I paused at the bottom step, listening. I could just make out my bro- my mother's even breathe, even heavy breathing, coming from behind her bedroom door. With the coast clear, I climbed the stairs and pulled my bedroom door closed behind me. I still had almost two hours before I needed to be in the attic, so I took my time eating my way through the sleeve of crackers. They weren't much, but they quieted my growling stomach for the time being. Time to eat some dry lint. <laughs> for some reason, I only start feeling hungry in the mornings when I do it. Mm. Your brain must use a lot of energy for sleeping. Which apparently is a thing. Like, if your brain's really active when you're asleep, you can actually get hungrier when you wake up. My backpack was propped up on my desk, carried up here by my mother while I slept. I assumed I slept through my usual homework time, and had a few other things to do while I waited for midnight to come. I tried to read the assigned chapters of Pride and Prejudice, but I was still too edgy. The hours of sleep had given my body the rejuvenation it needed, but my blanket of calm, but the blanket of calm I'd woken up with was quickly disappearing as the night progressed. I read an entire page of the novel before I realised I hadn't taken in a single word. How could I concentrate on Elisa's boy problems when I was trying to come come to terms with my own? Frustrated by my lack of productivity, I shoved the book back into my bag with a growl. If I couldn't knock out my homework, perhaps I could try writing another letter to my secret admirer? I found the notebook and pen and opened it to a blank page, but... As the minutes trickled by, the page remained blank. No string of words sounded right. With a sigh, I gave up on that task as well. It was eleven o'clock, and I didn't expect my letter writer to appear until closer to midnight. Even so, I was bored with my room, and figured I might as well make my way to the attic. I grabbed my notebook and pen and crept into the hall. I hate when I read, but I don't remember a single word. I hate that too. When your brain just doesn't want to, and you're like, oh, look, I read words, but my brain does not save any of them. <laughs> Before heading towards the attic, I stopped at my bathroom and peered beneath the sink, just as I'd expected. It was stocked with candles and lighters, ready to be lit in case of a heavy storm, in case a heavy storm took out our power. I balanced a lighter on top of my notebook and proceeded down the hall. Once I made it up the stairs, I ignored the light switch and hit the button on my phone, causing its flashlight to flare to life. There was something comforting about the boxes of herbs and the other random objects littered about the area that I hadn't noticed on my first trip up here. The attic had grown on me, I was quickly becoming as comfortable as the treehouse I'd used as my getaway spot while growing up. Focusing is difficult. Jeez. Your internet's acting up. Oh no! I hope it behaves itself. Void's internet, behave yourself! I felt at peace in the small room. Like it was as much my home as the miscellaneous items that spent most of the last century boxed up here in storage. Taking a deep breath, I approached my table and set my things down. He was expecting me to be here, so there was really no point in trying to hide. Before I could stop myself, I flicked the lighter on and set the flame of the candles, set the flame to the candles wick. 
The candle bathed the room in light instantly, its flame sending shadows that bounced playfully around the room. I turned my flashlight off and sat down. As I waited for my secret admirer to show up, I reveled in the fact that I was finally getting somewhere with him. He said we could talk, and I understand. I understood that to mean he was going to answer some of my questions. My mind reeled with all the things I wanted to ask him. Who was he? How did he manage all the impossible tricks I'd witnessed in the attic? Did he actually live in the woods and... If so, how many more like him were there? I was contemplating on how I would word all my questions when the window opened up in front of me. The air swirled lazily inside. The air that swirled lazily inside was comfortingly warm, probably one of the last warm nights of the year. I was suddenly grateful that it wasn't raining. Wet paper would make our correspondence much more difficult. Not to mention the rain would be miserable for my secret admirer to stand in. I looked at my phone and smiled, my heart already accelerated in anticipation of our meeting. It was only 11.15, but the mysterious Z had arrived. On cue, a familiar shape fluttered through the window and landed delicately on my outstretched palm. I wasted no time in opening the bird tonight. The words on the page were still written with a beautiful hand but they slanted in an almost rushed fashion, like the letter writer was excited for this conversation as I was. My eyes read swiftly over the short note, made easy by the light of the candle. Good evening, Cammy. I'm here as you requested, ready to div divulge the information you seek, but first, how are you? Can you send your replies like you did last night? I'm ready to finally talk with you. Oh, how exciting! Let's get some hydration before I start this bit. Is this how our ancestors texted each other back in the day? Yes, most likely. Except with less witchcraft. Except back in the day, falcons would intercept messages. Fine, now we have hackers intercepting messages. <laughs> I smiled at his greeting and quickly tore a sheet from my notebook. Now that the time had finally arrived to talk to him, the right words seemed to come to me easily. Good evening, Z. I think you have me at a disadvantage. You know my name, but I don't really know yours. I'm doing great, by the way. How are you? No, you're not. Oh, Ezekiel! Oh! It doesn't begin with a Z! Zeke! Oh my god, that's such a YA name. Purse. Like, sorry, I, I just... My eyes skipped down and I saw the name and that's so YA. It's great. I love it. Love the cheese. Tasty. In a matter of seconds, I had to... I, I had the note folded into a paper aeroplane and launched it out of the window. I didn't bother aiming anywhere in particular. If he had a way to control his paper bird, surely he was able to direct my aeroplane as well. His reply was quicker than I would have believed possible. It took less than a minute after I sent my letter flying, but I was starting to believe that many impossible things were achievable when Z was involved. Good old Gorgonzola! Ezekiel Rivers. My name is Ezekiel Rivers, but my family and friends just call me Zeke or Z. I'm glad to hear you are doing well. You could say that I'm in a better mood than I've been in my entire life, thanks to you. I read over his words twice before responding. Ezekiel. It was a pretty name, but not very common one. Certainly not the name of anyone attending school. I bit my lip and considered how to respond. Okay, Zeke. It's nice to finally sort of meet you. I have to confess, though, while I've been enjoying your letters, I've also been slightly frightened by them. It sounds like you've been stalking me. Am I wrong in that assu assumption? There. Acknowledge the elephant in the room right away. I wanted to learn more about Zeke, but first, I needed to know what he was. I needed to know that he wasn't a danger to me. I only had to imagine his response for a few minutes before the next bird flapped its way inside. I have a calming voice. Oh, thank you, maiden. 
That's a girl, are they? Fellow British VTuber! Oh, I know that model you're using too. There's a familiar cat girl on the... <laughs> uh, I, I need to find your... I know that model. I think I know that model. No, I can't click on you. No, I don't want to kind of time you out. No, no, no. I, I pressed the wrong button. Go to channel. That's the button I wanted. It's an maid. Nice. Yeah, is it is it the cat girl from Etsy? With the with the black and the white hair. It's beautiful. It's one of my favorites. I very much like it. Yeah, welcome. Uh since a lot of people on the internet show their faces, I bet I'd be able to get a crow to deliver a letter as a thing. I wanna see if it works. I don't you you I, I don't think that's how it works. It's not the face, is it? it? I don't know. I don't know how homing pigeons work actually. Or homing hawks, I suppose. You have to do some 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 research. That's the word. <laughs> words. What are words? Words are hard. I didn't mean to halt your reading. You also have a new subscriber. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Oh. Nah, I don't mind. I'm okay to halt, halt my reading for, for chatters. That's absolutely fine. We can, we can chat and read. We can do words. What is a concept? Indubitably. Words are hard. But anyway. Let's see what Ezekiel said. Me? Stalking? I can see why you would think that, given some of the things I've written about you, but the truth is, I have never followed you anywhere. I observed you from a distance, but only because you were already looking. Does this mean when, when they were looking at the forest? You see, on, that, on the day you moved into your house, I was visiting it as well. The house... The house, the house, the house once belonged to my family, and we've made a point of looking after it over the years. My, the job currently falls on me, and when I saw you and your mother arrive, I couldn't help but observe you. I feel drawn to you in a peculiar way, one that I struggle to describe. Every time I came to check on the house, you were there, and I, the pull only grew stronger. I felt like I would burst if I didn't share my feelings with you, and... So I wrote the letter knowing, in all likelihood, you would never find it, but you did. Despite the all the odds, you found me, and have continued to seek me out. Do you believe in fate, Cammy? Ah, uh, okay, I know how it is, Brainy. You're subbing to a fellow VTuber, but you're not subbing to me, okay. <laughs> I can sub to you if you want, Void. But... Subbing to fellow VTubers is also NETWORKING! Preserving from a distance. It's still creepy. It's still a little creepy. Still a little creepy. The long response left me breathless. I mulled over his words, trying to understand them quickly. Yeah. So he wouldn't be waiting hours for a reply. His family once owned my house, and they've been keeping an eye on it over the years, but... I knew that the house hadn't been owned in a century. That the house hadn't been owned for a century. Did that mean they were ghosts, after all? I needed to put that theory to rest. I don't know if I believe in fate. I've never really thought about it, but I am still confused. You say your family has watched over the house for a hundred years. Are you dead? <laughs> are you dead? Bro, are you dead? <laughs> I'll go and sub to both of you, like, right now. Void the well, I go to channel, press the sub button. There you go. Subscribe. And now I have messed up my setup so much. It's fine! Go to channel. Subscribe. It is done. Yeah. Friendship. Okay, so my question might have been a little blunt, but 
I was never good at sugarcoating things. I just needed to know the answer before I drove myself crazy wondering about it. I threw my aeroplane outside, and a few moments later, I thought I heard quiet laughter coming from below. <laughs> the question you gotta ask the question <laughs> when the bird arrived this time it circled around my head playfully before stopping in to land in my hands no cammy i am very much alive i am 18 years old scheduled to turn 19 in six months my great grandparents along with others in my community escaped into the forest 100 years ago we've been living there any si ever since we have no contact with people outside the forest. And I could get in a lot of trouble if they found out I was talking to you. It's our biggest rule. Keep hidden and remain safe. He's an elf! He's an elf! <laughs> I don't believe in fate, Rumi the Scholar. Am I a joke to you? Her ability is fate manipulation. Uh, I mean, is it fate manipulation or is it probability manipulation? Because is fate not just probability with a fancy word? <laughs> I pulled over his word. I, I puzzled over his words, trying to make sense of what he was saying. There was a whole community of people cut off from the rest of the world, living secluded within the cursed woods. I knew the area of trees had to be huge, but I also found it hard to believe that no one had discovered them yet. How had they stayed hidden so long? And why were they hiding in the first place? I'm glad to hear you're not a ghost. I've been a little worried. Why are you living in the woods and what made you escape there? There was a longer pause following the delivery of my last question. And I had a feeling he was contemplating telling me something. When I opened the next bird, I held my breath, anxious to uncover more of the myster mystery surrounding Zeke. This isn't a topic I feel comfortable writing about. I would rather discuss it with you in person. It's getting late and I need to get home before anyone discovers I've been gone. Would you be interested in meeting me tomorrow? I can come around midday if you like, when the sun is up. I'm sure you still have some reservations about me, as you should. I encourage you to bring a weapon or anything that makes you feel com more comfortable. All I ask is that you be alone. I can't risk sharing my secret with anyone else. I'm trusting you, Cammy. I hope you can trust me too. As I read his parting words, a thrill shot through me. Whether it was fear or excitement, I didn't know. He was willing to meet me in broad daylight, here at my house. I knew I was being reckless and breaking every rule in the book when it came to online dating and chat rooms, but I really wanted to meet him. More than that, I wanted to hear his story. I was ensnared by his mystery and I was finally present with the opportunity of uncovering it all. I'll be behind my house at noon, and my mum will be at school. Just don't try anything funny. I'm feistier than I look. It was a pleasure talking to you, Zeke. Good night. I knew he had read my letter, when a voice spoke quietly in my ear, carried on the wind just like it had the night before. Until tomorrow, Cammy. Sweet dreams. The window slid noiselessly shut, and the candle blew out in a wisp, leaving me alone in the darkness once again. Da da da! Ah, uh, probably for probability manipulation. What is fate? I don't write dictionaries for a living. Fate is a really cool anime series. <laughs> My Chromebook can't play Limba, should I sell it? If your Chromebook, like, Limbus is an app game, isn't it? And a, and your Chromebook can't handle it? That's terrifying. That's when we find out the deities that decide fate are just TTG, TTRPG players. Oh no! So my life is decided by some D&D DM, then I hope I roll a D100 in a... D120 in April. What's my favorite anime? Favorite, favorite, favorite. It's always between Bleach and Fate. And with Fate, it's very hard to pick which one. But but Bleach is my OG. Bleach, Bleach is um, bleached into my soul. <laughs> I'm assuming that's a yes. Probably. I can't even play Bloody Limbus. 
Admittedly, I, I can't say I played and I've logged into Olympus. I haven't actually seen what the combat is like or how heavy it is, but it's an app game. If you, if 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 your Chromebook can't run what your phone can run, the Chromebook is shit. <laughs> you may as well get a big tablet at that point. <laughs> Your favorite anime character is me. <laughs> I'm technically an anime drawn character, so that, that tracks. Wow. We had a chat with the wizard boy, with the with the elf. I'm I'm gonna call him an elf boy from here on because he lives in the forest. Am I being stereotypical? Yes. I don't care. Chapter ten. Classic British anime, the reading on the Sunday. It wasn't hard to convince my mum that I needed to stay home the next morning. I laid awake at the crack of dawn listening for her careful footsteps. When my door cracked open announcing her arrival, I curled myself into a ball under my covers and made myself look pathetic. She took one look at my shivering exhausted form and announced that I was in no way going to school today. Oh no, what a shame. Mom, I had so many important things to do at school today. <laughs> I nodded my head and did my best to hide my smile. It was a little concerning how easy it was to get how easily I was getting my way. After my mom left for work, I stared up at the ceiling as the time ticked away, my mind numb with what I was about to do. Maybe I'd made a mistake in telling Zeke I would meet him. I still had no proof that he wouldn't hurt me. I could stay inside and watch from my window, hand on my phone in case he decided to break in, or I could avoid him altogether and go to school claiming I was feeling much better. At least I knew I'd be safe there. Perhaps I was foolish for wanting to go through with this plan, but I wasn't a coward. I could take care of myself after all. I bent over the side of my bed and extracted the heavy little bottle from its hiding place. I cradled the pistol against heavy little box, not bottle. I cradled the pistol against my chest and gazed out of the trees of the cursed woods. Knowing the tree is housed more than just animals, I heard each night. I wondered if Zeke was still asleep, or if any of his people realized that he exposed them all to a stranger. The druid of the letters. Yeah. It could be a goblin or a fey boy, that's true. The phantom of the up, I mean the letters. <laughs> it, this is a very American book, very American. Very gun. <laughs> that would have been a uh, you know, Gase emote to express more love, but yeah. Boy, I haven't had much time. It's on the list, it's on my list of things. Maybe it is, maybe I should put it there. Let me actually write it down because I will just forget things. I do need to do some more emotes. I have some slots that I've just got stuff on. So your theory was right. I was joking though. Apparently it was right. The UK could never. We could not. You could not just have a gun under your bed. <laughs> Unless it was airsoft. I think that's the only way you could get away with it. Very good. Much America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got out of bed and went through my warning, morning routine ru ru morning routine in a daze. The gun accompanied me, accompanied me everywhere I went, like a pet that needed to watch my every move. It waited on the dresser as I got dressed, the bathroom counter as I brushed my teeth, and the kitchen bar as I sipped my tea. Even though I had hours before Zeke would arrive, I was comforted by the gun's presence. My father wasn't here to protect me from my bad decisions. At least his weapons could act in his place. As the sun rose higher in the sky, I made my way to the back porch to wait. It was 75 and sunny. A perfect day to spend outdoors. I sat on one of the cushioned chairs. The gun waited patiently on my table beside me. As the morning breeze swirled my hair around my face, I let my mind wander. If you could look 
past the fact that he lived in the woods, my relationship with Zeke really wasn't all that different from the other boys I'd talked to over the years. He was still just a boy, assuming he wasn't lying about his age. I got butterflies in my stomach when I thought about seeing him. And the way he had talked back and forth with the letters, patiently waiting for the other to respond, was a lot like texting conversations I had with my previous crushes. Not to mention, I had always hidden my relationships with my parents until I decided which direction they would go, so the secrecy is nothing new. I may have never taken a gun on a date before, but that was the first time for everything. <laughs> Can I get away with merchandising Boomerang Briny? I hope he doesn't give her a riddle she has to solve in order to get 10 tons of gold. Boomerang me. Weird. I don't know how long my teenage brain rambled on, spouting different facts and scenarios that could justify my actions, but when I looked up, he was there. He stood at the edge of the forest. The first thing I noticed about him was the colour of his hair. It was as dark as the shadows dancing in the trees behind him. His outfit was made of tanned leather pieces sewn together by an expert hand. I wondered how many animals had given their lives for its creation. Although the leaves and grass swayed in the breeze around him, his hair and clothing remained perfectly still, the elements of the world seemingly lacking in their strength to touch him. He belonged to a, in a different time, a different place. I found myself thanking whatever force allowed him to be there. The backyard stretched between us, and we gazed at each other silently. I didn't know how long he had been standing there waiting, but when he finally caught my eyes, he smiled. I returned his smile and nodded my head. It was the only permission he, need he needed before breaking into a jog and closing the distance between us. I stood up as he drew near and hastily shoved my gun into the back of my pants. I didn't want to make a spectacle of myself brandishing a gun in his face, but I knew when I caught the humour in his eyes that he had seen it. At least he knew I was armed and might think twice before trying anything on me. Cammy, he said huskily. His voice was even richer than it had been when it spoke on the wind. I took a few steps off the porch and waited in the grass for him to reach me. He approached me slowly, making no sudden movement, as if I were a small animal he were trying not to spook. He extended his hand towards me, his eyes lighting up with hopes as he waited for me to accept it. His eyes were lit with a lot more than hope. I realised as soon as I realised as he stood before me, they were the lightest shade of blue I had ever seen in a pair of eyes, almost electric and striking in comparison to his black hair. It was an odd combination, but fitting for a boy with the name Ezekiel. I hoped I hadn't been staring at him for too long. I knew that I probably looked like an idiot with my mouth hanging open. I grabbed his hand and shook it before he decided I was actually an idiot and started second-guessing our meeting. Hello, Zeke, I said easily, as if we weren't two strangers meeting for the first time. As he squeezed my hand back, I became aware that he didn't feel like a stranger to me at all. I'd never seen his face before, but his features settled in my mind like I'd known them my whole life. I should... I shook my head to clear the fog. If I was going to think crazy thoughts like that, then I probably shouldn't be trusted with the weapon hiding beneath my shirt. Focus, Camille. You still don't know this boy. Sometimes I wonder how Briny's brain scrambles some words and letters. Is it probably some undiagnosed like dyslexia? Most likely, yes. <laughs> uh, not too tired. It is night. It is 35 minutes past 8 o'clock.
I love reading one of these YA books where the boy looks like George. <laughs> yeah, you just know. You just know what he's gonna look like. Name like Ezekiel. Of course he's gonna be dark haired with blue eyes. And, oh, I love it. I love the cheese. Zeke allowed my hand to slide out of his reluctantly. I gestured towards the chairs on the porch. Would you like to sit? I asked. He nodded his head and I waited for him to climb the steps first. I might have felt unusually comfortable around him, but that didn't mean I was stupid enough to turn my back and offer him an opportunity to steal my gun. We each took our places in the chairs, our knees only inches apart. His smile was timid and portrayed none of the confidence I'd felt while reading his letters. I realised that he was shy. I'd had experience with this before, of course. You might text a boy for hours about endless topics, and then you meet him in person and discover he was too afraid to open his mouth, let alone tell you about himself. But unlike some of the boys I had dated in the past, the silence for Zeke wasn't uncomfortable. Oh, hello, horror sands. Welcome. But, Briny, there's no cheese. Why must you make me hungry? You're mean. I can't help it if the text is cheesy. Just imagine the cheese. Imagine the taste of cheese when there is a cliché. <laughs> we stared at each other for a while, simply drinking each other in. After a few minutes of uninterrupted staring, I decided to break the silence. Did you make your clothes yourself? What a rude thing to ask! Stupid, stupid! I chided myself. My face must have shown the horror I was experiencing because he chuckled at my expression and shook his head. It's okay, Cammy. I know I must look ridiculous to you, but no, I didn't make them. My grandmother has remarkable talent for sewing. Okay, but I have a uh, kind of trouble imagining things. That's okay. Um, just think the word cheese, then it's fine. Just go, oh, there's a cliche. That's cheesy. And cheese is tasty on a pizza. <laughs> That'll do. That'll do it. We both admired the handiwork of his clothing in another moment of silence. It was pretty amazing how flawlessly one piece of skin flowed into the next. I couldn't detect any holes or snags that would expose him to the elements. Without thinking, I reached out a hand and felt the material on its arm. It was soft and smooth, and quite worn in. I was rubbing my thumb back and forth over his sleeve when I noticed his stillness. He was rigid as stone, and his eyes start stared at me wildly. <gasps> widely in surprise. Oh, she's so bold! <laughs> he Google showed me the taste of cheese. <laughs> Whoops, I was like a minute or two behind, didn't notice. No one in the chat didn't make sense. <laughs> Whoopsie doopsie. Sorry, I breathed, snatching my hand back at once. Seriously, what was wrong with me today? I normally wasn't this forward. This was the kind of behaviour I would expect from Natalie, not me. The lack of sleep over the last several days must be affecting my head. No, it's fine, Zeke assured me. His shoulders relaxed instantly. He smiled at my apologetic expression and took a deep breath. There was a renewed confidence in his face now. I watched his shell crack before my eyes. The truth is, I wasn't sure what to expect when I finally met you in person, he admitted. I was afraid you might take one look at my clothes and rugged appearance and run, a run the other way. I shrugged. I am not a fan. I'm not a huge fan of running... Mood. <laughs> we both chuckled and I admired his smile. I wondered how someone living in the woods managed to keep his teeth so white. Surely they didn't have dentists in this little community. I could just imagine Zeke reclined on an overturned tree with a man dressed in an animal's skin peering inside his mouth. They probably have to use some kind of bone to pick up their teeth. The thought made me giggle even more. He sighed again, and I could tell he was working himself up to say the things he'd come here to say. I held my breath and allowed him the time he needed to find the right words. 
seconds passed and he finally met my gaze. Okay, so you wanted to know why we live in the forest, why we had to escape. My people are different from everyone else. I'm different. He paused and I could see the struggle in his eyes. This was hard for him to put into words, but it was also hard for him to discuss with someone like me, an outsider. Of course, I already knew that he was different. Not just anyone could light a candle without a match or make inanimate objects fly. I was intrigued by the mystery at all, and I knew I wouldn't get another decent night's sleep until his secrets had been revealed. I needed to hear his story. I nodded once at his statement, beckoning him to go on. He paused again, watching my face closely to gauge my reaction. We have the ability to use magic. Magic? Magic? Yeah, what else? What else would explain everything? I should probably start following the 10 hour rule so I can manage my caffeine intake and sleep better. That's, that's wise. Truth is, I wasn't sure what to expect when I finally met the person. It definitely wasn't a gun behind your back, though. Apparently he expected that much. <laughs> that was the bit he expected. The rest of it, not so much. <laughs> Magic. I didn't know what I had been expecting, but that bold word never crossed my mind. Aware of his eyes on my face, I quickly composed it into an emotionless mass, determined not to make a fool of myself again. His words were stunning, but I didn't let the shock of them show. I'd known there was something special about him. It was really hard to accept that he had used magic to perform those feats. Was it really hard to... Was it really that hard to accept that he had used magic to perform those feats? There wasn't another explanation as far as I could see. So after a moment of careful consideration, I smiled. So magic is confirmed in this universe. Okay, so ghost waifus. Mm, yeah. The only magic I know of is like a... Uh... Did someone say waifus? <laughs> <laughs> no, everyone's underage. Unless you happen to be underage, then no waifus. Unless you like her mum. Unless you're into MILFs. No waifus. <laughs> There wasn't another explanation as far as I could see. After a moment of careful consideration, I smiled. So you're like a witch? The words tasted funny in my mouth, but my question was still light. Aha, now that was a... Uh... These are some of the lines from the trailer. Yeah. I was honestly curious. Weren't witches supposed to be female? But I didn't know the right term to describe a male. Warlock? Wizard? Magician? None of the above? Zeke let out a breath and smiled back. He'd probably been holding it in, holding it the whole time I pondered over his confession. Relief that I wasn't turning away in fear, or more likely pulling my gun on him, made his features light up all over again. Uh, we don't use a specific term to describe ourselves, but yeah, you, you could say we're witches. Magic flows through our veins, and we're taught at a young age to control it. I nodded my head, pretending his words made sense. In a way, I guess they did. I'd been close to believing he was a ghost for a while. Was it that, was it that much more difficult to believe he was a witch? And the people in your community, they're all witches too? I asked, interested. How many of you are there? I could see him adding the numbers in his head. His blue eyes squinted slightly in concentration. Uh, around 50 or so now? There used to be more of us, but many were killed when we left your town. His face twisted in pain, and the darkness of a time long past painted a shadow on his face. I remained silent as he collected his thoughts. We didn't used to hide. We lived among your people in peace, not flaunting our magic, but using it for the good of all. But people feared us, even though we would never harm them. They rounded us up and meant to kill us all. 
A few families were blotted out entirely. Zeke whispered, his eyes distant, focused on the memory of his people's demise, despite the fact that it happened years before he was born. We both looked out at the trees as he went on. The ancestors of those of us who remained managed to escape to the forest. We can move quickly when we want to. And it wasn't hard to leave them all behind. The community we have now is well protected by magic. It would take a miracle for humans to find us on their own. The air was still quiet, as if the wind and birds stopped to hear Jake's ta Zeke's tale. I let his words hang in the air for a moment as it all sank in. I saw he was watching me. There were tears in Zeke's eyes as he waited for my reaction. I could feel how deep, I could feel the deep pain of his loss. People stretched. It was a scar that would never heal, no matter how many generations passed in their absence. I'm sorry for your loss, I managed to say. My throat seemed to have closed up. It was obvious Zeke's people had been through a lot. I was no stranger to loss. I felt the hollowness in Zeke's eyes mirror my own grieving heart. If your people have to stay hidden to survive, why would you risk telling someone about them now? I asked tentatively. Zeke closed his eyes at my question, and when they reopened, the tears had vanished. His blue eyes still sparkled in the sunlight that now made its way onto the porch as the sun followed its downward arc in the sky. His lips curled up, and he inspected my face. Because of you, he said simply. He leaned back in the chair as though I might need some distance from him, as he spoke his next words. I'm risking everything I am, everything I have, because I had to meet you. I can't explain it, but certain forces are drawing me to you. I had to give my feelings a chance, even if you tell me today that you never want to see me again. He held my gaze steadily, and I could feel the weight of his words as they settled on my heart. I wasn't used to declarations like this, especially from someone I had just met. I didn't know how to respond to such a statement. There are more secrets about my family, things I'd like to share with you over time. I'm not going to overwhelm you with all of them today, he began. I know you need some time to think of uh, everything. To think over everything I told you, and I know there's a good chance you might want nothing to do with me after this. I want you to take as much time as you need, and I'm not going to contact you again until I know that you're ready. If you decide you want to continue seeing me, light the candle in your attic at midnight. You could do it tonight, or you could wait two weeks and to make your decision. I'll watch for it every night, and I won't contact you. Till I know you want me to. The decision's yours. Zeke stood and walked to the edge of the porch. He bent down to a rose bush and plucked a flower. Its buds still closed in slumber. With a wave of his hand, the flower opened and revealed the most perfect white rose I had ever seen. He turned back to me and laid it carefully in my lap. I'm trusting you to keep my secret, Cammy. Even if you decide not to see me again, my fate and the fate of my people are in your hands. I nodded my head slightly, staring at the boy only a few feet away. I was memorizing his features, and he still seemed to be doing the same with me. We were still staring at each other in silence, when the sound of crunching gravel had both of us turning in the direction of the driveway. Panicking, I whipped around and to look at Zeke, but he was gone. At the edge of the trees, I thought I saw a shadow move. Until next time, Cammy, he whispered over the wind. I smiled back and whispered back. Until next time. Oh my god, you should put that white rose in her ponytail! I know, doesn't that look so good? It's his style, bro! <laughs> I know, I was expecting it to be a red one. But no, let's be all pure and have a white one, shall we? A white rose.
they have talk. We know about the witches in the forest. At some point during Zeke's departure, I must have risen from my chair to get a better view of the trees. I was standing at the top of the step leading up to the porch, my hand resting lightly on the rail when the red pickup truck came into view at the end of the driveway. It was only two o'clock, but I wasn't that surprised to see Uncle Peter out before school was dismissed. In my experience, principals seemed to make their own rules. I was just grateful. We had such a long driveway and Zeke could apparently move at the speed of light. I didn't know how Peter would react to seeing me with a strange boy in animal skins conversing with his niece, but I had a feeling it wouldn't be any inkling. After killing the engine, Uncle Peter spotted me on the porch and made his way around the truck. I heard you weren't feeling well today. I thought I'd come check on you. He began, his eyebrows knit together, a genuine concern shone in his eyes. Maybe I should give maybe I should give my uncle more credit. My father had always believed Peter though he was my father had always believed Peter thought he was better than us. But he could have changed in our years apart. It might have been stellar acting skills, but he seemed like he actually cared about my family now. I nodded. I was still in a daze from my meeting with Zeke. It was hard to focus on something as real and mundane as my uncle after hearing Zeke's story of magic and his people's fight for survival. Peter must have been seeing something in my eyes because his expression grew slightly darker. His eyes scanned the trees of the cursed woods suspiciously, making me wonder if Zeke's escape hadn't been as clean as I previously thought. I held my breath as he finished his search, but when his eyes returned to mine, they were as light as ever. Maybe I'd imagined the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. I has fashion. Batman his way out there. He totally did. Why are you outside, Cammy? Uncle Peter demanded with a shake of his head. You should be inside, resting where it's warm. I was about to exclaim that it was warm outside, but that's when I realized the sun had finally descended below the tops of the trees leaving me in shadows and cold. Suddenly the breeze didn't feel so warm anymore, and I shivered involuntarily. I just needed some fresh air, I said sheepishly. I didn't realise it got so cold. I was about to turn around and head in the house, but then I remembered what I was hiding behind my shirt. Was my shirt loose enough to hide the shape of the gun, or would he see the outline bulging in the back of my pants? That was a conversation I didn't really feel like having. Luckily, I was safe from finding out. Go on, upstairs, get to bed, Uncle Peter said gently. Your Aunt Lacey made her famous homemade chicken and noodles. I brought some. Go to bed and I'll bring you a bowl. Once Peter had turned towards the truck, I backed quickly into the house and did my best to sprint through the kitchen and living room without knocking anything over before ascending the stairs two steps at a time. The box sat on my bed exactly where I left it, the revolver and bullets shining menacingly up at me. I returned the pistol to its home and slid the box back under the bed with a foot. I was tucked under the covers and catching my breath when Uncle Peter ha em entered the room with a steaming bowl of soup. My eyes lit up at the si sight of the provisions when I didn't have to fake my graciousness. When was the last time I ate a real meal? The smell of the broth made my mouth water and Peter set the bowl carefully on my nightstand and perched on the end of the bed beside me. Your mother won't be home for at least another hour. Don't be disdained, she gets here. The concern had returned in my uncle's eyes and for the first time since I started, I felt a little guilty for faking an illness. It felt good to know my family cared about me, but... I also didn't want to worry them over something I lied about. Everyone was being so good to me. And I knew if I continued down this path with Zeke that the lies would only continue. That's okay, Uncle Peter. I replied. Really, I'm probably just going to eat the soup and then try to take a nap. Thanks for coming all the way out here to check on me. Tell Aunt Lacey I said thanks for the soup. Uncle Peter returned his smile. 
and his eyes crinkled at my appreciation. He grabbed the blanket and pulled it up to my chin before kissing me on the forehead like I was a little girl. The action pressed on my heart, so similar to the sort of thing my father would have done for me. The love in his eyes mirrored that which I had witnessed in my father's eyes on countless occasions. Along with something else, uh, I couldn't quite put my finger on. Feel better, Cammy. And just remember, if you ever need anyone to talk to, I'm just a phone call away. Uncle Peter's kind of sus. Is Uncle Peter a witch hunter? I'm afraid. I'm afraid. He squeezed my knee through the blanket before getting up and leaving. I didn't completely know what to make of my uncle. I'd lived almost 18 years of my life without him showing interest in me, but perhaps losing my dad had marked me with a sign that read, Needs a father figure? Peter and Lacey had never conceived any children of their own, so maybe now that I was here, they might start viewing me as the daughter they never had. I didn't know how I felt about that, given the clear dislike my dad held for my uncle while he was alive. How would he feel if he knew that the man he'd always considered to be too stuck up was now filling his shoes as the leading male role in my life? I didn't decided to tuck that subject away to ponder over another time. Do you have the Among Us sound effect? I do not. When was the last time I had a meal that wasn't restaurant or something thrown in the microwave? <laughs> Should probably do that. I had a wonderful uh, beef stew today. We, we slow cooked it in the day. It was lovely. I had too many things on my mind at the moment. The primary one being the emptiness of my gut. My stomach growled loudly and it took everything I had to eat the soup in a calm enough manner that didn't splash all over my bed. I gave up on the spoon after a few moments and drank the bowl dry. I could just see my mum cringing at the slurping noises coming from my mouth. The face I imagined her making was too much and I giggled into the bowl resulting in a line of broth dribbling down my chin and onto my comforter. I shrugged at the yellow spot on the blanket and proceeded to wipe my mouth with it. <laughs> oh, how very teenage. <laughs> how very gross and teenagery. I'd get around to finning it later. Right then, I wanted nothing more than to turn my mind off and sleep until my mother kept got home. All the hard decision making could wait until later. But my mind wouldn't shut off. Even as I closed my eyes and willed myself to fall asleep, my brain felt like static filled it felt like a static filled TV. And I couldn't change the channel. It buzzed with ideas of witches and betrayal. Random words and images flashed through my mind one after another, but never formed a coherent thought. <laughs> you would wipe your dirty mouth on your blanket? You do that right now, that's disgusting. That's disgusting, get a tissue. You're an adult, get a tissue. <laughs> if you're gonna have something that's gonna be a little bit messy, have a tissue ready to go. Don't wipe it on your bloody blanket, it's awful, no. Also, don't eat on your bed in general if you could help it. No, no. Well, that's minging. You're minging. I used to blow the straw paper wrappers off the straws, which are normally done. That's always fun to do, especially if you can aim for someone. <laughs> I was completely wired, but... And there would be no relief until I faced the worries that plagued me. I was saved from having to acknowledge those uncertain times by the interruption of a new buzzing one. One that didn't exist solely in my head. I grabbed my phone off my nightstand and sat up in relief. Have you erased me from your, your life? Michael. I really hadn't been the best friend to him lately, but with everything else that had been going on, it slipped from my mind. I felt guilty for a moment before reminding myself that he hadn't texted me since my first day of school either. Friendships were meant to go both ways. Who's this? I don't recognize the number. 
I watched the bubbles spring to life at the bottom of the conversation. This would be fun. The crumbs give me strength. No! Oh, no. When you go to bed and you got crumbs in your bed. Oh, no. Wait, you don't dirty your blanket on purpose? <laughs> I guess I don't know what I'm wasting. Not the blanket. Now, exactly! It will just smell like food. And then, like, you'll be hungry all the time. It would just smell like the broth, and you'd be like, I don't want to smell that right now. <laughs> and then you might dream of broth. That'd be really weird. <laughs> Camille Stone! I laughed as I typed up my reply. That's so weird. My name is Camille Stone. What are the odds of finding a of one finding my number? We teased each other back and forth for a while before getting into a real conversation. Of course, he wanted an update on how my new school life was going. Well, I joined the art club, do you believe it? In Plainfield, I had avoided clubs, sports, and all social gatherings, like it was the plague. Art had been my passion for half of my life, but I'd always kept to myself, only sharing it with those who were closest to me. Leave it to the loudest girl in Green Peaks to force me out of my shell. It's about time you started making friends. You've been there for a couple weeks now, and you've had plenty of time to find yourself a hot boy toy. Am I right? I love to wake up to the smell of garlic parmesan on my blanket. Oh, that would be awful. If only because you'd be like, oh, that smells really nice. And then, like, but you're about to go have boring-ass cereal for breakfast. It would just be torture in its own little way. No, 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 no. I sighed dramatically as I stared at the tiny bright screen. Was it? It was. It was too much to ask for Michael to continue distracting me from my problems for too long. Of course, he would bring up one subject that I'd avoided thinking about all afternoon. I had to admit, Zeke was cute. Okay, who was I kidding? He was downright gorgeous. There was a wildness about him that could only be produced from an upbringing in the woods. And I never met a boy more mysterious. The fear I'd felt over the presumed stalking had dulled tremendously after meeting him in person, and it seemed to have transformed into a charge that only fueled my attraction even more. But I couldn't tell Michael about those feelings. You're hesitating. I am right! Crap, I spent too much time fantasizing about meeting Zeke. Yeah, damn it! Boys, boys, boys! I'm Italian, I like the smell of parmesan regardless. <laughs> Who is this? I don't recognize this number. Hello, this is Bob George, here to report your car's extended warranty. What? I don't own a car. I ride the city bus. Do you want to sign up for one? Me? Nee. Tongue? <laughs> and now Michael knew something was up! It was a testament to our friendship that he could read me from a hundred miles away, all because I hadn't replied to a text fast enough. I couldn't try to lie my way out of it, claim I'd been in the bathroom or something, and that's why I hadn't replied, but I knew Michael wouldn't let it drop. A part of me didn't want him to let it go anyway. I needed someone to talk to about this. Even if I didn't give all the details it was better than holding it inside of me and risking driving myself crazy over the thought of it fine varna i give i might have met someone a kaleidoscope of butterflies took off in my chest fluttering towards my throat as i finally told my secret to someone i didn't realize the weight had been so burdensome until it was released spill it now i want to know everything Everything, not a chance. Considering my situation and fumbled to find the right words, disclosed just enough truth without revealing anything that might harm Zeke or his family. Or more likely that might result in my best friend drawing the conclusion that I need a straitjacket. His name is Zeke, short for Ezekiel. He's a year older than me and definitely hot. Like a 10 out of 10. 
but he has a bad boy vibe going on. He might be dangerous. I'm not sure if I want to go for it or not. There. There was nothing incriminating in that description at all. I mentally patted myself on the back for killing two birds with one stone, finally getting Michael off my back about my boy situation, and sharing just enough of my secret with someone to prevent myself from combusting under the strain of keeping it for another second. Bless her. Honey, you've played the part of the good girl your whole life. You've got to expand your horizons. This guy might be exactly what you need. I am getting more valley as we go, dear girl. I wasn't surprised at Michael's sentiment. He was all about bad boys and taking risks and living life on the edge. But that's never been my way of doing things. I like structure and making smart and safe choices. Before all of this started, I'd been one of the most down-to-earth teenagers you'd ever meet. Then I found that second letter in the attic and everything changed. What if this guy is too much, though? I don't want to bite off more than I could chew. I gasped and rolled my eyes at Michael's next message. That advised me not to bite something. <laughs> then waited patiently for the blinking dots, informed me that he had more to say. You only live once, right? As long as you don't suspect this guy being an actual serial killer, I said go for it. If it doesn't work out, at least you'll know you gave it a shot. I knew Michael's advice might not have counted for much, given he didn't have all the information regarding Zeke, but just how much of an outsider he was. And just how much of an outsider he was. But his encouragement to give him a chance made me feel lighter nonetheless. I was a teenager after all, and my life had been drastically boring up until this point. Maybe it was about time I took a chance on something and leapt headfirst into the unknown. Boo! Ah! Hello. <laughs> BRB, gonna live in the woods for a bit so girls find me wild and attractive. <laughs> Tis the YA way. <laughs> I'd planned on giving my decision a lot more thought. I had fully intended on stressing myself blue over the next couple days, going back and forth over whether seeing Zeke again was a good idea, but talking to Michael had been a had been the breath of fresh air I needed after confining myself to my to the stuffiness of my own mind for so long. I felt rejuvenated. Renewed and had the sudden resolution that I didn't need to torch myself over a problem that I already knew the answer to. When my mum arrived home, I met her downstairs and let her see my pink flush cheeks and embodiment of good health. It had been a while since I'd appeared in such high spirits and I didn't bother hiding it from her. I told her Aunt Lacey made us some soup and Uncle Peter dropped, but dropped it by. And when... And we shared the rest of it for supper, finally using the dinner room for our first meal since moving there. We ate at the unnecessarily large table in quiet peace, neither mentioning what it meant for us. To me, it was a symbol of acceptance. Things had changed for us, would likely to continue to change, and everything would be alright. I went about the rest of my evening as a normal girl should. I called Natalie and got the scoop on what I missed at school and talked to her late into the night. My heart already lightened. I didn't feel the need to bring up the details of my own day or how I'd been spending my letters fill letter filled night. I accepted that from then on my life would be split in two. I would live the life of a senior girl who spent her time hanging out with her art freak friends and trying to score decent grades before graduation and the life of a stranger who believed in the mysterious happenings in the cursed woods, witchcraft, and the possibility of love at first sight. It was, in, it was easy to stay awake with my heart pounding in my chest and my mind racing over the possibilities of my future. So after I hung up the phone and Natalie went to bed, I took the step into the unknown that I'd suspected I would take all along. 
I made my way up to the attic and lit the candle at midnight. Oh yeah, she's ready. Ready to face things. Stuff. Romance. But what's going to go wrong? We're only 34% of the way in. What's going to go wrong? Cammy! I jerked awake at the lunch table, staring at a bowl of goldfish crackers and knocking over Natalie's chocolate milk in one sweep of my arm. Had I actually just dozed off in the middle of a crowded cafeteria? My friend's gaping stares and torn expressions of amusement and concern suggested that I had. It. <laughs> My movements were slow and robotic as I collected the spilled crackers, uh, the milk already being scooped up by Jason and Taylor's napkins. It appeared that Zombie kept meal had returned for her second act. Sorry. <sighs> I yawned widely. And Natalie just shook her head and helped me return the crackers to the bowl. A week had passed since I lit the candle in the attic making my statement to Zeke that I wanted to continue our relationship. What that relationship actually was, I still didn't know. I'd spent the last seven nights staying up late and exchanging paper airplanes for magical birds, each note revealing more about its sender. It was sort of like having a pen pal. I could honestly say that the boy who'd scared me out of my wits made me question my own sanity and consider telling the authorities that I had a stalker, was now one of my closest friends. We weren't two strangers exchanging letters anymore, but two friends conversing in the only way that seemed safe for the time being. As much as those letters revealed about Zeke. However, there was still so much left to be said. I felt like I'd been tasked with painting a sunset, but... The only colours available to me were black and white. I could produce a grayscale image, but I lacked the most important details, the ones that granted the sunset its beauty. Right before something goes horribly wrong, what could possibly go wrong? I knew that Zeke had two loving, somewhat overprotective parents and a younger sister that he enjoyed picking on, and who... He secretly loved more than anything in the world. I knew his favourite hobby was shooting the bow that he crafted himself, exhibiting a precision that elevated him as the best marksman in the entire coven, even without using magic to guide his arrows. Despite knowing his interests and dislikes, it was the things that couldn't be said that I craved to learn the most. I wanted to see his eyes crinkle as he watched his sister play. Hear his steady breathing just before he released an arrow. I wanted to watch him smile when he didn't know I was looking, and hear his laugh when I made the lame joke. I wanted all of the colour that came with truly knowing someone. The black and white letters weren't enough anymore. Gotta go make a call! Well, thank you for coming, Boris. Appreciate it. I hope the call goes well. Aaron Gunn, match made in heaven. Is everything okay, Cammy? Natalie's voice was low as we collected our trash, the lunch hour coming to an end. I was startled to learn that she was capable of speaking so quietly. Jason, Taylor and Carly had moved ahead of us, and I realised she didn't want the rest of our group to hear. I couldn't be honest with her, though. I couldn't tell her that I was losing sleep because I'd been spending my nights getting to know a witch that lived in the woods. A witch whose feelings for me seemed to grow stronger and stronger every night we talk. Even if I wanted to tell her about Zeke, a big part of me did. I just didn't see how it would be possible. Telling Michael those half-truths had been one thing. He was a hundred miles away and had no way to fact-check my story. Natalie would see through my lies in an instant, and then be hurt that I couldn't tell her more. Above everything, I had to protect Zeke and his family. Urged on by my prolonged silence, Natalie touched my shoulder gently. 
Is this about your dad? Guilt squeezed in my chest, its fingers clawing through my ribs and settling around my heart. Or maybe it was my lungs because breathing was suddenly impossible. It had been days since I thought about my father, and those days suddenly felt like years. Was I a terrible daughter for letting a boy distract me from the loss that had turned my life upside down? Or was my dad to be happy that I had a reason to feel something other than grief for the first time since he died? I didn't know the answer, and it made me feel worse. I didn't realise I was crying until Natalie folded me into her arms. It's alright, Cammy. I've got you. Her whispered words only made my gut clench tighter. I flash back to the never-ending car ride with my mother and all of the necessary stops along the way. I wasn't going to throw up in the middle of the cafeteria. I wasn't. But I couldn't pretend that my odd behaviour was attributed to the loss of my father. Somehow that lie seemed the cruelest of all, not only to my friends, but also to his memory. If I let her go on believing that was what this was about, for another second, I thought I would actually lose my lunch on the floor. No, I said tightly, pulling back from her embrace. I wiped my eyes clumsily with, my, with the sleeves of my jacket. I was lucky I'd been in too much of a zombie state that morning to apply any eyeliner. What a mess I'd become. This isn't about my dad. I gave her a small smile before looking around the room. The cafeteria cleaned out during our scene, and thank goodness for that. I didn't need an audience witnessing one of my rare displays of emotion. But I also didn't need to be the last one walking into class after the bell rang. My face still red and streaked with tears. We needed to get moving. I gathered up the trash we dropped and looped my arm through hers as we made our way towards the door. My mind reeled for an acceptable lie. Anything I could tell her that would... would result in my guilt growing strong enough to ex <clears throat> that wouldn't result in my guilt growing strong enough to expel my stomach's content at least we were nearing the ed nearing the garbage can so i wouldn't make a mess all over the floor then i had it another half truth something that needed to be addressed anyway i've just been struggling a lot lately with my schoolwork i mean i met her eyes and gave her one shouldered shrug. I'm pretty sure I failed my calculus exam yesterday. We'll find out when we get back when we get them back next period. It wasn't a complete lie. I really had been struggling with my schoolwork in the past week. I was napping during my usual study time so I could stay up all night writing letters, and my focus had been strained during class too. It was all too easy to tune the teachers out and think of Zeke replaying some of the conversations in my head and thinking up new topics for us to discuss the following night. I said I would split my life in two, but my life as a senior in high school was quickly becoming ignored in the face of my other, more interesting one. I was failing at keeping them separate, keeping them both alive, and I needed to change. Needed that to change. I needed help. Oh, Cammy, you've been such a ghost lately. Natalie squeezed my arm. Um, I would call a technical truth a half-truth, because it's not the real reason. It's not a truth. It's just something that happens to be true. It's just not the answer to the question she asked. Therefore, it would be a half-truth. And not a technical, like, technically a truth, yes. Just not the answer to that question. It's a lie for that question, but not something that is a lie in general. I think that would be a half-truth over a technical truth. Natalie squeezed my arm, still wrapped around in hers, after dumping the remainder of our lunches in the bin. If you've been having trouble, you should have asked for help. I can't say that I'm completely understand calc, but I'm happy to struggle along with you after school any time. I squeezed her arm back and brushed away the last of my tears. It was easy to get caught up in the idea of Zeke, the excitement of getting to know a guy for the first time, especially when he was the most interesting person I'd ever met. But I couldn't forget about my other friends. Natalie would keep me grounded. If I let her. She could be my tether to life. 
I needed to hold on to when the magic and excitement of my other life threatened to sweep me away. I'd really like that. Thanks, Nat. The rest of the day went by more smoothly than I could have hoped for. I managed to scrape up a C on my test. A lower grade than norm I normally scored, but still a lot better than a big fat F. Than the big fat F I was expecting. When my eyes drooped again in English, Jason slipped me a couple of caffeine pills from one of the many compartments of his backpack. They did the job of perking me up, but also caused a tremor in my hands that lasted the duration of the period. By the time Natalie's truck carried us down my long driveway after school, I was feeling almost like myself again. The cans of coke I snagged out of the fridge only improved my mental state even more. We sat on the back porch, the same seat Zeke and I had occupied only a week ago, with our calculus books laid open on our lap. We tried to talk through the previous lesson before, the upcoming quiz on Monday, but it was calculus after all, and sometimes having a second brain only confuses things more. <laughs> So basically, an invisible number is the square root of a negative number. Natalie mused. She rubbed the end of her pencil against her face, as if she were trying to erase her eyebrow. Wait, I, I thought they were imaginary numbers. We both flipped back a few pages before giggling. Definitely imaginary, but who's to say they aren't invisible? We can imagine them however we want, can't we? <laughs> We laughed and sipped our coke, having a good time despite the boring task at hand. Even if studying with Natalie brought me no closer to an A, I was still glad to be doing it. I just wished I could open up to her about all of my secrets, like a normal best friend best friends were meant to do. After 30 minutes of studying and getting nowhere in our understanding of imaginary numbers, Natalie's phone began to ring. I recognised the song from the many boy band CD she'd always blasting in her car. An imaginary number, like 11 teen and 30 12, they are definitely imaginary. Invisible number, the numbers you can't see. The numbers that hide in the dark. <laughs> What's up? Yeah, I'm at Cammy's, we're doing homework. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I should have told you. I'll be home in 20 minutes. Natalie rolled her eyes and sighed dramatically as she hung up the phone. Sorry, Cammy, I should have known my mom would be freaking out after hearing the news. I'm not sta saying it's serious or anything. I meant it's scary, but... She needs to calm down a little. I sat forward in my chair. What? What news? Natalie gave me a strange look as she shoved the textbook in her backpack. The news everyone's been talking about all day? Like in every class? How have you not heard about it? I thought back to my day at school, but struggled to remember any announcements or pieces of go gossip. Apparently my zombie self had been in full control because I couldn't remember talking to anyone all day or even listening on other people's conversations. I really needed to get my daydreaming under control if I didn't want to gain a reputation like Carly's. I shrugged and pinned her with a look that said, well, tell me already. Natalie sighed and dropped her bag before sinking back into, her ch into the chair. Her movements suggested I was asking a lot from her, but her eyes were bright with anticipation of being the one to share something with me. It had to be gossip then. And a juicy bit of gossip, as it looks like. Apparently a girl is missing. Natalie's voice was hushed with, severi with the severity of her words. But I couldn't. But I could just... Sorry. But I could still see the light in her eyes that suggested she enjoyed sharing the news with me. It was like the day she... She and the others told me about the cursed woods and the strange history of my house. A town like Green Peaks rarely saw any excitement, and even a tragedy like this might seem thrilling to some. Almost like a ghost story. Her name's Heather Reed. She's only a year older than us. I don't know her well, but it's a small town. 
Natalie went on. I could just recognize the caden cadences in her speech as she like she as if she were telling me a ghost story. She's a freshman at U UW now, but she came home to watch her little brother's baseball game last week. Supposedly she planned on heading back to school as soon as the game was over, but I guess she never made it. For several days her family thought she'd gone back to school, and her roommate thought she decided to spend a few more days at home. But now everyone's comparing their notes and no one's seen her in a week. I gasp, my eyes widening. Natalie smiled as if my reaction were exactly what I'd hoped for. What about her car? I asked. I couldn't help myself. I was interested. Surely someone's seen it. Natalie shook her head. No. No one's seen her or her car since her brother's baseball game. Her mother did watch her leave, but who knows where or when she actually disappeared. She could have gotten all the way to Lar La La Rami Laramie? and been kidnapped there or stopped to get gas or eat along the way and ran into trouble there. Who knows? I let a soft whoa escape from my lips before shaking my head in a way. It was crazy to think something bad could happen to someone in such a small town, but the reality of things like this happened every day. People went missing. Schools had shootings. Fathers died while drunk driving. Well, I was surprised that a place like Green Peaks would be any different. This town might have been my mother's blank slate, but that didn't make it immune to the same evils we had escaped from. This was the real world, and tragedy could happen anywhere. Anyway, Natalie jumped her voice back to its usually peppy volume. My mom's mad. I didn't let her know I was where I was, as if there's actually a serial killer on the loose and green peaks. She rolled her eyes. Talk to you later, Cammy. With that, she skipped across the yard into her truck, lugging her flowery book bag, beh book bag behind her. I remained in my seat and flinched when her truck roared to life with a growl. I will probably end soon, but I sensed some drama coming up in the book. So I thought I'd at least go to the end of the chapter. And then we'll cover the end. If Heather disappeared exactly a week ago, that was the day I finally met Zeke. Was there a significance there that I was missing? But no, that would be absurd. I was looking for elements, connecting factors that didn't exist. My meeting with Zeke couldn't possibly be related to a girl's disappearance. It couldn't have been Natalie's ominous rendition of the girl's tale. It could be Natalie's ominous rendition of the girl's tale, but I was suddenly paranoid that someone was watching me. The hairs on the back of my neck stood straight, as if they were craning to look around me and find the perpetrator themselves. I was being ridiculous, though. Just some random girl I'd never met had gone missing. Didn't mean I was in any danger. Natalie's unsettling voice put me on edge. I was just starting to calm myself down when the movement in the trees caught my attention. The woods were dark and too far away to see the figure clearly, but something had definitely moved. Something big. And I had a feeling it wasn't an animal. Natalie was already too far away for me to call for help, and Mother was at an evening PTO meeting. I was home alone. And if someone wanted to attack me, now was the perfect time. The figure shifted again and I could just make out the silhouette of a tall man. My heart pounded in my chest. I jumped up and prepared to run to my room. My gun! I need to lock the doors and grab my gun! There was another motion that stopped me in my track. The figure stayed where it was, but something else continued towards me instead. A bird flapped its way across the yard, closing the distance between us, slowly as it struggled to stay upright in the wind. When it finally reached my destination, my out my destination, my outstretched palm, it transformed before my eyes into a perfect paper rose. I smiled. Zeke. As I did say, that is unfortunately the end of the stream. Someone's gone missing. Oh no. 
We are 37% of the way in and the plot is gonna start kicking off! I'm excited. I knew there was gonna be potential murderers? Murdering? Murderesses? Murderu? I, I, I hope none of her friends get murdered. That would be bad. And what does that have to do with our wizard witch boy from the forest? We don't know. We'll have to find out next week. Oh my god. Thank you everyone for coming. Ah, uh, so you're spoiling us. Got it. It's in the trailer! Void, it's in the trailer! I gave you guys access to the trailer and it's in- I believe it's still in the description. But the murders are in the trailer. Time to add some corn flour to thicken up this plant soup. Yep. Nothing like some disappearance of some murders. Oh, I'm ready to see you again. Like, night, night. Yes, thank you ever so much for coming. Thank you anyone who left. Thank you to anyone who is who's in the chat. Thank you to anyone who watches the VOD. Did I do them in the right sentence? I don't even know. My brain. <laughs> uh, if you enjoyed this video, I would highly appreciate it. If you could leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. Or if you're on Twitch, subscribe. Like, follow the channel. Um, I will be back tomorrow with some... Thing. Let me check what I put on my schedule. I think it be, I think it's more Final Fantasy. I think I think Final Fantasy. Let me let me check the schedule. I forgot what I put on my schedule. Brain. Uh, that's not my schedule. Where's my schedule? Where did I put it? No. Where did it put? Oh, there it is. Found it. I found it. No, it's not Final Fantasy. Okay. What we will be back with tomorrow is a bit of a special stream. We're going to be writing a choose your own adventure on, 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 tomorrow. We're going to be writing a choose your own adventure together tomorrow. Uh, but that should be fun. I'm excited to do that. I have, I have one kind of started and I'll just let you guys like, help decide where the paths are gonna go and where it's gonna go. I've got like the base concept and we'll just have fun together from there. It should be good. I look forward to it. Uh, so look forward to that tomorrow. I will have my schedule out probably tomorrow morning. And that is it. I'll see you then. If you'd like to support me in money ways, if you really appreciate it and would like to throw some cash my way, that would be lovely. If you would like some, some goods and services for said cash, I have a Patreon, and I have a, um, a merch store! Oh my god, brain, come on. I am clearly, <laughs> I clearly need to stop. I can, I need to do a recording of this so I can just play that at the end of streams. I need to just make an ad. So I can just play that so my brain doesn't get so frazzled at the end of a stream. <laughs> Not what I meant by spoil. I just meant add more time to your stream spoil. I see. Um, yeah. On that, I think. Throws 5k at 19 miles an hour. <laughs> I would be in pain and potentially in hospital, but at least I'd have money. <laughs> Yeah, you're really descriptive. I do. I need to write this shit down. I need to write it down somewhere. That that's gonna be a job for tomorrow as well. Um, write a closing stream script. Write closing stream script. I always forget stuff. I always do. I have big dumb brain, and big dumb brain will be back tomorrow. But for now, I had fun. I hope you had fun. Thank you so much everyone for coming. This has been Brandy Rose Smith, live from the Bid Library!